of the Essen Summer School. Uh, I'm quite uh, happy that despite it not raining and it being the last day, uh, still quite a lot of you made your way here. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome Stephen Muggleton from Imperial College, uh, who's going to talk about logic-based and probabilistic symbolic learning. So when I was an AI undergrad and I was reading kind of a textbook in my second year course, I learned about logic and thought that was great. And then I learned a bit about machine learning, which was in its infancy, and I thought that that's it, great. And then I came across um, inductive logic programming, which had, been, had come out, I think, recently at that time, and I thought, that's amazing, that's something that combines both. Um, so I'm, um, personally, I'm, I, I found this very exciting and uh, I think for Essence as well, as we do a lot of work that uh, crosses over the two um, methodological approaches, it's of particular interest. And uh, so join me in uh, welcoming uh, Stephen. And Thank you. Okay. So, uh, th thanks very much, uh, Michael. So, I'm going to give uh, three lectures, um, and uh, the general uh, area is, as, as mentioned, inductive logic programming. Um, I'm going to uh, concentrate on both the logic-based aspect of it and the probabilistic extensions, but both within the context of symbolic learning. Um, and in this first lecture, I'm going to uh, give some kind of general motivation uh, for, uh, the, uh, for the, the, the area and also for the distinction I make between uh, this kind of symbolic learning and statistical learning. Uh, so most, the vast majority of what you'll see now in machine learning conferences I would call statistical learning. Uh, where the, uh, the role of, of symbols is uh, secondary or non-existent. Um, and I'll start by making a case that uh, human beings, the, the kind of learning that we have as human beings, um, uh, contrasts quite strongly uh, with uh, uh, current notions of statistical learning. Okay, so uh, you probably haven't heard, but there's, an, there's actually a, a kind of a new uh, EPSERC priority area coming up that uh, Alan Bundy and I and others are going to uh, be involved in, and this is called uh, human-like computing. So there's a kind of general interest in this uh, within the research community uh, here and elsewhere. But I wanted to start off by looking at some uh, characteristics that distinguish um, the kind of learning that you expect to see with humans compared with the state of the art in machine learning, uh, which is largely based on uh, a statistical theory of uh, uh, observation of, of large numbers of instances. So the first thing that we're going to look at is um, the number of examples uh, that you normally uh, require uh, per concept. And uh, here, um, if you look uh, at uh, cognitive scientists, including uh, Josh Tenenbaum's paper uh, in Science in 2011, um, there's a rather uh, surprising fact from a, from a machine learning perspective uh, that uh, actually humans learn from tiny numbers of examples, typically around about one. Uh, that's the first observation you make, you start to learn something from it. Um, and you, maybe you get more than that, but uh, typically you extract a huge amount out of a single example, and I'll give you uh, an instance of that um, in a later slide. But for the theory of machine learning, um, this is uh, something that is inexplicable. So uh, if you look at the standard theory of computational, computational learning theory, it assumes uh, large numbers of instances uh, and uh, the, uh, the properties that are being learned require these in order to get uh, stable estimations. And so uh, in uh, in modern uh, machine learning, the expectations is that you may well have tens of thousands 
or with big data, millions of, of examples uh, from which you're learning a particular concept. And most of statistical learning is aimed at learning a single concept, isolated from everything else, maybe on the basis of a set of features, but it's, you learn it from, you're given a bucket full of millions of examples and you learn that concept. Okay, this couldn't be a greater contrast to, to what happens uh, uh, when humans learn. However, if we look at the number of concepts that humans are learning simultaneously in any period, Actually, again, this contrast, I mentioned that in statistical learning, you're typically just learning a single concept. Maybe um, in some paradigms you might be learning uh, two or three, but uh, never many at, at once. Whereas humans often learn <coughs> thousands of things simultaneously, which are all concurrent. They're all going on and they all interact with each other. And again, looking at the... Uh, uh, at the uh, Cog Science literature, we find that that's, uh, that's a, a, a normal uh, uh, expectation for human learning. Thirdly, um, when we learn, we don't learn in isolation uh, just looking at data. Uh, we learn in the context of uh, large amounts of uh, existing background knowledge. So prior knowledge that we have about the world, uh, we apply our common sense uh, uh, ideas to what we see, and we use this in order to maximize the amount of information we can extract out of e each instance. And that goes a long way to explain how we do this amazing thing of being able to learn from a single instance. Um, uh, whereas, uh, again, uh, uh, in, in statistical learning, normally there is no place for even for background knowledge um, if you're looking at, uh, say, regression techniques or you're looking at um, uh, uh, support vector machines. All of these techniques don't really have much of a place for background knowledge. Um, the structure of what is learned <coughs> Uh, by human beings tends to be modular. It tends to be reusable as well. And uh, again, that contrasts strongly with, uh, the, with learning uh, uh, in the statistical setting in which what you learn is monolithic. There's just one uh, model that is learned or maybe a set of averaged models that are learned uh, in a statistical model. Okay, so uh, uh, you, you may doubt some of these facts, but I wanted to uh, give you a couple of examples. Um, the first of which uh, is a personal example. Um, uh, I was uh, sitting with my daughter uh, watching television when she was growing up, and um, she's a dancer, so she's, she's le she learned up to quite a high level how to dance while she was at school. And she was watching a television program in which uh, somebody was performing a dance. And uh, I, w I watched her uh, at the end of the program, after the, at the end of the dance. She stood up, having observed this new dance, and carried it out, at least to my untrained eye, uh, fantastically well. Uh, she uh, had observed just once uh, this, this dance on television. Uh, somehow this had gone through her visual perception, turned into some uh, notion of how to coordinate a series of actions which to all intents and purposes in a different body frame now produced a similar effect to my eye as the performance on the television, this flat screen that she'd been looking at. Um, so, uh, so this is an example of uh, learning from a single instance and I claim it's, it's actually very typical of the way that human beings learn. So uh, the, the key things is that later I noticed that when she was doing dances, because she often did dances around the house, she'd not only taken the dance I'd seen, but parts of it were being incorporated into other things that she was cre creating as dance movements um, on top of what, uh, it, within her her uh, repertoire. 
Um, so uh, this gives an example of uh, the way in which uh, our minds allow us to do quite complex forms of learning that uh, uh, build small motor programs out of visual perception and allow us to be able to generalize and modularize what is, is learned and reuse it in other contexts. Uh, this is nothing like statistical machine learning. Um, it would not be achievable in that setting or even within the theory of machine learning as it exists. Example number two, in case you think that was an isolated example, I just want you to consider uh, the following about, um, about uh, a context which we're all familiar with, which is that of learning words in our native language. Okay, so um, it's very easy to estimate um, the number of words uh, approximately that somebody knows. All that you need to do is randomly op open pages of a dictionary, check whether they know the words, uh, you know, pick out a word and check whether people recognize and can describe what it means. Um, and you find that uh, the, for an average undergraduate, they know around about 20,000 words in their own language. Um, that may not seem like a, a great number to you, but um, consider the following. If you divide 20,000 words by 20 years and 365 days, it means that on average, uh, each one of us has learned almost three words a day since we're born. Every day. Have you learned three words today? This is, this is on average, and this is just uh, what, you know, what every human being does. So how do, we, how do we make sense of this? Uh, did we get thousands of examples of each one of these words? Actually, there's a second clue as to what happens with the learning of these words, which is called Zipf's Law. Uh, Zipf's Law says that the presentation of new words uh, is inversely proportional to their, their frequency of being presented. So that means that uh, the curve, the inverse curve that's given for Zipf's law shows that there, each one of these words when were first presented, you saw only once. And from that, you may have read the word, typically a lot of the vast majority of these words uh, uh, are for an undergraduate, are learned in the recent past from learning, from, from reading. You saw the word, and out of that, you assimilated it. And you probably didn't see that word again for some considerable period. But word assimilation involves a whole set of, uh, uh, of things happening within, within the brain. So to begin with, you recognize its visual form on the page. Secondary, you are able to guess or uh, hear and uh, line up its auditory uh, 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 sound. You guess from the context what it senses, and you understand uh, to some degree the way that it's associated with other concepts. And I say concepts here because if you think about it, the set of words that we have describe the set of concepts which we can, we can discuss uh, with other human beings. And these concept each of one of these contexts, concepts is interlinked uh, with those other words. So here's another a uh, compelling reason to think uh, that we are doing something that machine learning doesn't do in any way at all. We're, all the time we're learning from single concepts and we're doing so in the context of symbols uh, that we're using in complex ways that are tied into our whole symbolic world and description. Okay, so uh, Let's, let's try to make some sense of this because we don't actually have a model for how this could happen. Any model that we have should be sufficiently general to be able to support learning in the context of background knowledge from single instances, and it should support kind of general forms of, of computation. Okay, so uh, just as a kind of uh, idea for this, I'm, I'm suggesting that we could consider 
our general notion, our general model of, of computers as being universal Turing machines. And a universal Turing machine normally has a program tape, um, might have an output tape. Let's imagine there's an extra tape coming in here, which we'll call the observation stream. Okay, so uh, the odd thing that I'll say about this program as compared to a normal universal machine is that some of the instructions are filled in and others are left blank. Okay, so the ones that are left blank have latitude to be filled in uh, by the learner uh, in a way that's appropriate. And the task here is to provide explanations, if you like, of the observation stream, such that they are reproducible by the program. Uh, we're also going to, for simplicity, assume that these, uh, all of these squares are right ones. Okay, so you can't actually alter the ones that have been written, but you can write onto the blank ones. The writing must be non-deterministic, so that assumes there's some kind of interpretation which gives you different possibilities when a blank uh, is filled in. So this blank here could have turned out to be green or red or blue. Uh, when the first yellow uh, was consumed on the, on the observation stream. Now, wh what's, what's the purpose of all this, uh, this particular model? Uh, well, it, makes a, it, it allows us to think of general purpose computation, so we're talking in a, in a general setting here of a universal Turing machine. We're allowing the incorporation of learning by the filling of these gaps uh, in providing interpretations to the observation stream. And that's very much uh, in line with what we might uh, think of as a, a model of perception, uh, the attribution of uh, symbolic uh, interpretations to uh, observations. Okay, so um, uh, this, this general model actually, uh, surprisingly, can be uh, implemented to some degree, and I'll be talking about this in the following uh, uh, parts of the talk, um, within a logic uh, language um, uh, by using, well, in particular Prolog, by using one of the uh, attributes of Prolog as a language, and uh, the attribute we're going to use is the fact that one of the smallest prolog, one of the smallest programs that you can write in Prolog, is a meta interpreter. That is, some, that is a, a program which can interpret Prolog programs. Uh, a Prolog meta interpreter is, if you like, a model of a universal machine, uh, like the UTM, um, and it allows us as a way of thinking about how to implement that model that I've just described. Okay, so the things that are missing from a normal um, uh, prolog meta interpreter are that it's set up to simply do deduction. And what we would like is to be able to adapt it so that it still it can do deduction in, in as broad a sense as it can, but it can also take the additional uh, stream uh, of observations that I showed in the diagram um, and uh, a stream, uh, a, a, a set of, of, mo of uh, molds, if you like, or models for which uh, rules can be formed, so to allow it to build new instructions on those on the tape, and the provision of background knowledge assignments. And we can see these assignments as being substitutions essentially the parts of the tape that were already filled in, uh, which we can think of as a substitution set. Okay, so the output from the meta interpreter is a set of uh, hypothesized assignments, if you like, the right-hand side of that universal tape that was coming out. Um, and uh, this uh, idea has been implemented uh, uh, recently uh, over the last three years in a system called Met Metagol, which is built within Prolog, and uh, it, support, it allows uh, something that was previously very difficult. So it allows, uh, within inductive logic programming, it allows something called predicate invention, 
So when you do predicate invention, the, the system introduces and suggests new pre auxiliary predicates as part of the learning. And predicate le invention allows you to do problem decomposition, introducing these new predicates to represent parts of the problem and simplify the overall description. Interestingly, um, although uh, you can learn from a multiplicity exam of examples, it's easy to adapt this uh, meta-interpretive approach to learn uh, from single examples, particularly in the context of learning multiple tasks simultaneously. So if you look back at the differences with human learning, where you're learning single examples but over multiple tasks, this is a, a model of doing that. Um, and uh, it's, e it's even been possible to show uh, fairly recently in an Ichikai paper earlier this summer that the approach can be adapted to uh, optimize resources and you can actually show you can get uh, time complexity op optimization when learning simple algorithms. Uh, so the, the general framework uh, is one of meta-interpretation and it can be, uh, it can be uh, 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 altered in various ways without much uh, rewriting of the code in order to produce um, uh, uh, a model which is not unlike uh, that of, uh, of the properties of human learning that I was mentioning previously. Here are some applications of this approach which uh, I'm going to go into in more detail, but just to give you some motivation as to what this buys you. Um, in, uh, in a paper back in 2013, um, well, actually, this came from a presentation from 2012 by Claude Samet uh, at ILP, in which he had been using a three dimension, the 3D camera, uh, Microsoft uh, Connect 3 3D camera, um, as part of a, what was called a robo rescue uh, operation. So. Uh, this competition is run regularly, and uh, it's aimed at uh, uh, providing su uh, computational support for firefighters. So you imagine uh, fighting your way into a building which is full of smoke. You can't see anything that's going on. Uh, you have a 3D laser uh, camera which is able to give you some picture of what's going on. You would like to be able to very rapidly uh, get directions as to where the staircase is. So you, that machine needs to use its 3D model in order to uh, give you a pointer to the staircase, which means it needs to learn a staircase. So, so um, uh, Claude had uh, taken various different images from the 3D camera and, and used an existing ILP system to learn a staircase description. When I saw what he was showing, um, I realized uh, that uh, it wasn't recursive uh, as a description, even though it was a logic-based description that he'd learned using an inductive logic programming system. And so I asked him for the data. Uh, I took one of the images and uh, pulled out the, uh, the orientations of the planes and the proximity of those. And uh, from that single image, I learned this definition using Metagol, right? So, this is, can give you a paradigm of what Metagol does. Okay. When Metagol is looking at the staircase, it can see that there are various different planes. Okay. And uh, the staircase descriptions I'd given were intervals which went between one plane and another. So the X's and Y's here are planes. Okay. So what it tried to do is see whether it could simply describe a staircase um, in terms of those planes, um, but uh, although it could find that there, for instance, the first one had a vertical followed by uh, another plane which was horizontal, it couldn't complete the definition. Okay, so uh, instead what it said is, okay, I can describe 
that, I can introduce that as a new predicate called A, so this is an invented predicate. And then it says, okay, with A, suppose I, I tried using the other thing that I've got, which is staircase, to say that there's a staircase that goes from Z to Y. Okay, so uh, you've got, you've got a, a recursive definition. In fact, though, there's no base case at this time. So it applies this recursive definition, keeps on applying it, and then finds at the end that it finishes with a, a, a final call uh, to the predicate that it's invented, where it introduces, it, it says, okay, that finishes the staircase. So uh, does anybody here want to tell me what the meaning of A is? A has just been introduced as a symbol with no meaning associated with it. What is A? It's a step. It's a step. Right. Okay. So, uh, so the idea of a step here has just been introduced automatically. Uh, when we look at this, we can actually interpret what's going on, and I could tell the system, yes, actually, that's a step there, and it could just rewrite, and it becomes a, a comprehensible description. More than that, um, this uh, description will apply to any staircase in the world, right? So uh, I had a, a discussion with uh, my deep learning colleagues about this at one stage, and they told me, well, neural nets can learn these kind of things, and they said, well, you see, all we would do is we would learn, first of all, a depth one staircase, and then a depth two staircase using the depth one one, and so on, the neural net. So then I asked, okay, so you'd learn up to k, let's say, of depth. Um, what if I showed you a staircase with a thousand or a million stairs in it? Well, they said, well, of course, we wouldn't be able to learn that, but human beings wouldn't either. So I said it would be a very interesting experiment to see if a human being could recognize it, even though it had a thousand stairs. I haven't carried that experiment out, but I'm absolutely sure that anybody would be able to do so because we inherently have this recursive definition of a staircase in our minds anyway. Okay, so... There's a nice song, Stairway to Heaven. All <laughs> oh, right, okay. Yeah. Well, that's got an infinite number of stairs, so you don't need the base case even. <laughs> but if a thousand... Oh, it'll see that it'll see that there are some some little staircases, but it won't see that the whole thing is a staircase. It's just a collection of small staircases of length k, <laughs> which doesn't doesn't sound right to yeah, me. Is it clear whether people uh, recognize the staircase because of the recursion, or because they just see that hey, this locally looks like a staircase? I I don't know, um, but I still I. I doubt if people would be stumped at it being a staircase. That's all I'm claiming. I, how they do it, I don't know. Um, this seems quite uh, recognizable. Uh, uh, to audiences that I've shown this to, they can see that this is a recursive staircase, maybe because they're programmers. But uh, on the other hand, there's something curious about this, because having got this from visual data, I could actually use it as a plan as to how to ascend a staircase, right? What I need to do is I need to take a step and then walk up the remainder of the staircase, okay? So there's something quite compelling about this recursive definition of a staircase, apart from it being very simple to understand. Um, so, uh, so this may be just an isolated example, but um, I've been working with a group in uh, Nanjing in China where we were looking at trying to put together statistical and symbolic learning using, uh, as you su suggest, low-level recognition of features together with some higher-level definition. And we used a standard uh, vision package, uh, uh, which uh, they had been using already, and we compared support vector machine learning against ILP learning. and. Uh, with, with Metagol, Metagol got hired uh, accuracies on all of the randomly chosen uh, sets of uh, representing geometric concepts. And in one particular case, it, it, it was massively better. Okay, and in this case, this is, these were regular polyhedra. Okay, so if you look at the top two lines here, uh, these are regular polyhedra in which uh, there's 
some number of sides, right? It varies from picture to picture, but the key thing is that the length and the angles of the polyhedra are the same as you go around, around the shape. And uh, having extracted the, the lines, in fact, a similar kind of recursive definition uh, is learned for regular polyhedra, which does a check on the, whether the angles and lengths are the same, and it gets 100%. Out of about five or six examples, it doesn't need all of these examples, um, and the support vector machine using local context recognition gets a percentage uh, around about 56, which, is, uh, which you can't uh, distinguish from random. Okay, so, uh, so learning geometric concepts is again something which can be done efficiently and accurately using symbolic learning even though most people in AI think of vision as a kind of lost case, um, I think there's a case that vision is a highly symbolic um, area in which symbolic machine learning could play a large uh, part. And the, the learning times in, are, are relatively small um, for, uh, for this approach. It's not taking huge amounts of time to search through the concept space. Okay, so... Uh, Robotic applications are, uh, are frequently looked at in, in AI, um, and uh, both in Ichikai 2013 and 2015, we've looked at using this kind of approach for learning to do different things. In the first one, we were trying to learn definitions of, for building a stable wall, uh, pro again, providing a few examples uh, of uh, stable and non-stable structures. So this one's stable, uh, this one is not stable, and that one's not stable. Um, and uh, again, giving some primitives as background, we were able to find uh, uh, simple definitions with some uh, invention. In, case, in this case, the invention was related to uh, finding that, that there were collinear uh, groups of, of uh, lines of, of, of bricks in this case um, and that these were offset uh, between the, uh, the different levels. Um, and uh, we've also looked at learning strategies. So these are small recursive definitions. And in this case, uh, in Ich the Ichikai 2015 paper, we were looking at a robot uh, delivery system. Uh, this one is simplified to one dimension. So what you have to imagine is that a set of letters are randomly dropped onto some stairs and uh, each letter has got a, an address on. The robot doesn't know what the address is until it's picked the letter up. Once it's picked it up, it needs to take it to the right stair and drop it there. Um, and uh, there were two different types of, of uh, uh, strategy that were learned here. The first was very non-optimal, so the robot goes and picks up a, a letter, looks at it and takes it to where it should do, goes back to the bottom of the stair and repeats until everything is done. The second type, the robot actually collects up the letters in a single pass going to the top of the stair and then delivers them in one pass coming down the stair. So we were able to show that um, by uh, doing optimization uh, steps, we could actually get the second type of delivery mechanism, which um, t it runs in linear time rather than quadratic time uh, as a strategy. Um, so, uh, uh, Josh Tenenbaum, I already mentioned uh, Josh uh, and his student and I did some work back in, in 2014 where we were looking at uh, trying to emulate something w which uh, Microsoft had used in its Excel pro product for doing string transformations over, uh, over uh, um, Excel spreadsheets. So you, in these string transformations, you might get um, an email address that has to somehow be transformed into a person's name. So you might have s.gulwani at microsoft.com has to be transformed into s.gulwani, leaving out the at and the Microsoft and so on. So the, we, we had a, a set of these tasks that Microsoft had published 
and we learned uh, those tasks as a, all together uh, using predicate invention. And we found that if you learned each one of them separately on their own, then in fact the learning was much less effective. It took much more time, was less efficient. If you, if you did the learning in a stratified way, first of all, only learning concepts that could be defined with length one, and then using those concepts and any invented predicates to uh, extend the vocabulary for those that could be learned of length two and so on, you end up with a hierarchy of concepts. And in fact, uh, there's only one in the timeout uh, region. So we, get, we had a maximum, I think, of uh, two minutes uh, search time. And if you take longer than that, you time out. So four of the original tasks timed out with independent learning, with the dependent learning that builds the hierarchy, you get uh, only one of those left out. So um, building up a hierarchy of concepts in this way um, is very effective and efficient. Um, and, but one of the, the hard, hard issues that we're now facing is that we're built in this process if you take a cut through that hierarchy, just one uh, series of calls, so the, the whole program is much bigger than this that's learned, but you've got all of these invented predicates, F12, 3, F17, 1, and so on, down to the named um, primitives, uh, it takes a lot of work. You can actually figure out what's going on in this program, but only by figuring out what all of these intermediate predicates that were invented actually are in terms of their decomposition to smaller problems. So this is now starting to look like deep learning. I mean, we've got a whole lot of unattributed information here, and there's a hard task in seeing how we can, if we're going to build complex programs symbolically like this, how we can also think up useful and insightful names in the process. Okay, so, so we're looking at other applications with uh, Alan Bundy. We've been looking at learning proof tactics. Uh, we had a paper uh, in Japan that I've, I've just come from, um, presented by Colin Farquhar. We uh, did this uh, data transformation work, again, learning uh, how to transform different types of, of string data between one form and another. Um, so uh, in many kind of cognitively oriented problems, we're finding that uh, this approach um, is being uh, effective. Um, and uh, I'll conclude this first uh, lecture here uh, just saying that uh, there's, this is giving us a new form of what um, Luc de Rat has called declarative machine learning, where you declare everything. You declare the background, you declare the form which the rules are going to take and the examples, and you can use then general purpose solver techniques in order to find the solution. Actually, we're finding it using a meta interpreter, but in some sense, that's a declarative way of uh, solving the problem. You can actually use answer set programming to do the same, which we've tried, and uh, that's also effective. Uh, we've been able to show that sub-languages, uh, and I'll describe this further in the following lecture, are tractable, and we're able to learn a Turing complete fragment of higher order logic. We're able to get use uh, existing uh, techniques for ordering uh, rules which uh, provides guarantees of termination for queries and uh, we can go beyond the kind of simple classification learning that's typical of much of machine learning. We're able to learn strategies including visual strategies of how to recognize like the staircase. Um, there are many challenges uh, to, that we haven't dealt with. Um, it's early days with this, with this approach. Uh, but uh, I'll, uh, I think m some of these uh, issues should become clearer when I go now into more detail as to how 
the techniques work and what the um, where where the uh, next uh, areas are for for development. So I'm going to uh, suggest that we could uh, you can ask questions now if you want. I'm going to give you a five minute break and then uh, we can restart on the second lecture if that's okay. Any questions? Well, you've, you've asked as you've gone along, so maybe. Okay. Oh, sorry. The ideas about the the last one, please. The invented name and types. I'm wondering if you could do something like WordNet to suggest. Um. Yeah, WordNet w would be useful, um, but uh, I've also been thinking about adapting um, uh, techniques like currying in order to do this. So if you think of, for instance, um, the way that currying works, if you've got a multiplication, uh, a definition of multiplication, for instance, and uh, you... Uh, you consider that you can drop out one of those arguments by saying, well, when you multiply by two, you could just make a special uh, function that says uh, two times, okay, and three times, and so on. So by, by currying arguments, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, produce uh, new names out of old names, so recycling them. Um, and composition of of words from parts um, seems to be quite a, an attractive uh, approach. Uh, the danger is that you get something that's very, very complicated quite quickly. Um, and uh, there may be uh, some reason to think about the way, for instance, that um, the, the, the binomial system that was, you know, was, that was thought up for species naming um, was kept simple by uh, limiting the numbers of parts that you can use. I mean, basically two parts for, for the binomial system by somehow having a, a kind, kind of quite logical uh, approach for the combination. Okay, so, uh, so there are two tapes coming in, uh, one of which actually can, be, can go backwards and forwards, so it's a, it's, a, it's a program. The other one simply streams in and it only comes in uh, a, a click at a time. So as we try to um, interpret these, we can only consume these if we can produce some reproducibility. So we could actually uh, push the tape back out again by uh, by predicting its label, right? The, only w the, the prediction is only going to be achievable by having an appropriate m uh, mark on that tape. Okay, so the effect of this is the same as is happening in the meta-interpreter. The meta-interpreter is taking as examples a goal, which is a series of ground atoms. Those ground atoms have to be, exp have to be proved, right? So that's like consuming one of these uh, steps here. And the proof leads to the construction of a new uh, clause or set of clauses within the theory, right? So it's more, more than just changing a state depending on both, right? No, the, the, the UTM has a fixed, uh, is, a, is a fixed machine, okay? So it's got a state structure within it just like a normal UTM. But the, the marks on the tape give you a program that can be run through that. Some of those marks are incomplete. So you've got latitude to change the program, but there are some of those which are already fixed, which are, you can take as being the background knowledge. Okay? So it's like a partially determined program where you're filling the gaps in with the purpose of being able to explain the observation sequence. Okay, so uh, I'm not intending to build such a UTM, but I, I was just using it as a model for, uh, for what the meta-interpreter does. Yes. So, 
Oh, yes. Uh, okay, so the dyadic, um, you may have noticed uh, in the examples that I've given, like this one, uh, that actually these clauses are quite constrained. Uh, you'll see more of that in the lecture one. So uh, we've been studying a particular sublanguage, which we started looking at with um, family relations, where you've got only two arguments for every predicate at most. You might have one or two. Um, and uh, you also, it's even more restricted than that, you've allowed at most two atoms in the body. And although this seemed very constrict, constraining at, at first, it turns out that that's sufficient to incorporate a universal Turing machine. There's, there are already results that show that you can, you can build arbitrarily expressive systems just with that uh, strong constraint. The constraint of having only two atoms in the, in the body, which uh, is part of the universal Turing machine result, actually also has an interesting side effect for predicate invention, which is if I gave you as much string as you like here, you possibly could build quite complicated programs without doing any predicate invention. If I give you at most two there, you're forced to do predicate invention because you can't build complex structures within the clause. Uh, so it's a very uh, Spartan uh, language, but sufficient actually given the, addi the addition of new symbols in order to build arbitrarily complex uh, definitions. But under certain circumstances, uh, the reason I had that going beyond dyadic is that it, there's some things which are more naturally expressed uh, with more than two. Uh, atoms, even though there may, may be complex ways of expressing them within, with just dyadic, sometimes it's better. It's, <clears throat> it's more natural not to. But we don't know much about the theory of that as yet. Okay, so uh, should we come back at half past ten and uh, I'll restart. Okay, so uh, lecture two, uh, this is meta-interpretive learning. Um, and then lecture three, I'm going to be telling you about the Bayesian variant of this. So that's more probabilistic. This is the non-probabilistic version. Okay, and uh, the, the paper uh, for this lecture um, is, uh, is this one, which appeared in uh, the uh, machine learning uh, journal uh, this year, uh, so the online version is there, and in fact I think yeah, the printed version is up. If you want to be able to get hold of the paper, this paper, um, then uh, you should write down this reference here, basically, or search for my name under Imperial College, and it's under publications uh, from my main homepage. Sure. Missing unprinted symbol. Uh, I just noticed that as well. Yeah, there's a tilde there. Thanks. Okay, so uh, if you haven't managed to copy that down and still want to, then let me know and I'll give you that. Okay, so. Um, okay, so the. To begin with, the motivation for meta-interpretive learning wasn't, wasn't to do with uh, human learning. Um, it came as a development out of inductive logic programming. Sorry, yeah. So it came as a development out of inductive logic programming, which in turn came out of logic programming. So I'm going to go back to logic programming uh, to motivate uh, why uh, this rather recent development has happened. Okay, so um, so uh, Bob Kowalski's idea of logic programming was that you could take symbolic logic and take a fragment of it, and in fact that fragment was sufficient for general purpose computation. You could use it as a programming language, and so logic programming developed um, and was very successful. Um, uh, about around about 
there were various different people who tried to um, make a machine learning uh, uh, ver variant of logic programming. That those included, in a in a form in a more general form, the logic programming Gordon Plotkin uh, in his thesis in 1970, um, uh, Udi Shapiro in 1980, uh, around about then uh, in Yale. Um, and, uh, but it wasn't until the early 1990s that a group of us got together and decided that we would make a regular thing of, of, of uh, investigating the bringing together of machine learning and logic programming. And there was a, there's a series which, of conferences which has just uh, celebrated its 25th. Uh, it's uh, an annual uh, series which has been going on since 1991 under the title Inductive Logic Programming. Now, in the early days of inductive logic programming, there was uh, a lot of enthusiasm about the idea that having taken a general purpose programming language, uh, like uh, Prolog and the logic programming model behind it, that we could use machine learn, we could actually machine learn arbitrary programs. And you have to remember, Around 1991, uh, we're talking about decision trees, those kind of things, N none of which were, and, ne and uh, uh, neural nets, none of which could represent arbitrary programs. So this was quite an exciting prospect. And uh, there had already been uh, 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 ideas for how to do uh, something called predicate invention, which I've kind of exemplified to you, to remember the staircase, where you automatically introduce new predicates that allow you to structure uh, and decompose a program that you're learning. And people had looked at uh, building recursive programs for sorting, uh, for uh, appending, various different standard uh, logic programs had already been demonstrated to be learnable. So um, it's rather odd that when we reach the 20th anniversary of this uh, field, um, at a panel uh, on, on the conference that was written up as a machine learning journal paper, we concluded that despite all that early enthusiasm, there were no state-of-the-art systems that were using either predicate invention or recursion because uh, people had kind of lost heart with the complexity of the search problem at an early stage and abandoned it, thinking that it's far too hard to do uh, in practice. And they had restricted themselves down to quite uh, simplified problems involving learning a single predicate. So um, uh, the conclusion of, of that survey is that more work needs to be done in this area. And uh, 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 again, a group of us took it on ourselves to see if there was some way of doing uh, things differently that would make this problem more tractable. And OK, so uh, here's a, a kind of simple example to understand uh, that motivated us. So suppose that um, you are trying to learn uh, a, a, a dyadic uh, theory uh, involve, uh, about um, about a fa family relations. Okay, so it's sufficient to have two, uh, you know, uh, bi binary predicates throughout in order to write down uh, normal family relations uh, definitions. Here's a, a kind of theory that you might uh, aim at. Here's a, an imagined family tree. Um, and uh, we might have a mixture of uh, particular facts, like Father Ted of Bob. Uh, we can find Ted and Bob on here, and Ted and Jane, and so on. We might have mother and father facts. Uh, and out of those, we might try then to learn definitions like parent. Uh, in the normal way, parent XY is mother XY, or father XY. And um, we might, uh, again, use those definitions to build another layer to define ancestor, where an ancestor is either a parent or the parent of an ancestor. So <clears throat> uh, this is a, a, a dyadic program, which um, you notice uh, at least has recursion, at least in this case here, of ancestor. That's a natural thing to define. but. 
if we were just given, uh, for instance, mother, mother and father facts, and we were given examples of ancestor, in fact, we would need to automatically introduce and invent a parent. Parent's a bit like step in that um, uh, staircase example. And then the, we would have to build the definition of parent in that way. Okay, so there's, there's also a natural uh, problem of, of predicate invention, which might even occur in a, in a real family situation, in a human family situation in which children grew up with uh, their grandparents because their, their parents uh, were deceased, for instance. And then they had to kind of uh, in, introduce this intermediate I idea in order to make sense of, of the set of relationships that they knew about. Okay, so um, even this rather simple theory, um, because of the predicate invention and recursion, turns out to be hard using the state of the art ILP systems, which had been applied to lots of biological problems and all sorts of things, but it, it's, it didn't have the power to do these, uh, to do these tasks. Oops, sorry. Uh, I need to remember your coffee. <laughs> Okay, so, um, uh, so I, t I mentioned that this is based, uh, that the idea behind the technology that we suggested was a meta interpreter, and this gives you uh, a, a description of a, of a met modified prologue interpreter which um, takes examples, for instance, examples of ancestor, together with some background knowledge. So the examples come in as the, the, the series of goals that need to be proved. So the prover needs to prove these goals. It's got an initial program, right, which you can think of as the background knowledge. So that's like the, the, the parts of the tape, the Turing tape that have been defined. And then there's a final program, which is the, this initial program augmented by some additional part. Um, now, Unlike a normal prologue uh, interpreter, this meta interpreter, uh, it doesn't take uh, clauses from the clause base, the set of things that have been defined uh, in the logic program, but instead takes a, uh, from a set of, uh, of meta rules. Okay, and a meta rule is like a normal rule in the sense that it's got an atom and a body, but those are largely, the, the, the details of those are largely left open, including um, the, the uh, predicate symbols will be represented by higher order variables. Um, so uh, these meta rules now are, are executed through this meta interpreter. Each meta rule has an, uh, has an associated name, and the outcome of the interpretation is a metalogical substitution. That's a substitution for the variables, both higher order and first order variables. And there's an order which is imposed over the symbols that are used. Remember that we're, in, we're throwing in new symbols. So we've got a finite symbol set, but some of these are uninterpreted, and there's a total ordering over those. So once we've got that meta rule, we save a substitution that's associated with it into uh, our substitution base. And the substitution base is, if you notice, the program itself. So the program is simply, in the end, a set of substitutions. Um, and we transform program one to program three. This is much like the process of abduction in logic programming, if people know about that. We then take the parts of the body of the meta rule which have not been interpreted yet, and we prove those. That means we may construct recursively parts of the program that are missing to get us program four, and then we prove the remainder of the examples. Okay? So this looks like a standard interpreter in many ways. The oddity is that as we prove the goals, the end point of it is that we start off with no program and we end up with a program which uh, proves those goals. And if, if this terminates, by, by construction, that program is 
necessarily proves the examples. We don't need to carry out a search other than proving the examples. The process of proving the examples and any backtracking that occurs is the process of learning a program which proves the examples. Okay, so the methodological aspect of it allows us to simply treat induction, what the, the, the process of theory formation, as a deductive task where the deduction is carried out in a higher order logic framework and the substitutions are first order solutions to, uh, to the proving of those goals. Okay, so um, one of the mystery items here is that I haven't gone into detail is what do these meta rules actually look like? Uh, so let's now look at that. <coughs> so the meta rules have this kind of a form. Okay, so you'll notice that each meta rule looks like a rule. Let's say actually these are what I was mentioning before, H22. So they have at most two arguments in each case, and they have at most two atoms in the body. But <coughs> there's a, <coughs> a differentiation that's made between the variables, everything's a variable here, so p, x, and y are variables, but you notice this is uppercase p and lowercase x. The lowercase variables here are universally quantified, and the uppercase variables are existentially quantified. Now, you might wonder why do we need to have this uh, double uh, f form of quantification. Normal prolog rules are just universally quantified. If I wrote down one of these meta rules where everything was universally quantified, it would be claiming something very weird. It would be claiming, for instance, that for every P and Q and every X and Y, this is true, right? That, that's just a, a, a wildly general claim. If we assume that these are existentially quantified, all that we're saying is that there exist substitutions for P and Q such that that relationship holds. And that's much closer to the bias of the search that we actually want for learning a program that consists of rules that have this form with ground substitutions for P and Q. If, even though those, grounds, those P's and Q's are uh, higher order, um, they're higher order dyadic, and so we, don't, we expect only for the P's and Q's to be constants rather than lambda functions as they would be in arbitrary higher order logic. Okay, so um, this first meta rule we say is an instance because actually it requires a substitution for not only P but also X and Y. So for instance, Father Ted Bob is an instance that could be abduced using this meta rule. So the, the meta rule could introduce a fact into, uh, into the learned program. The second one, base, P, X, Y of Q, X, Y will form a rule where P and Q are substituted for something and we have an order requirement over these that P must be higher in a total ordering that's given than Q. So for instance, if the, the rule uh, parent if father, so parent X, Y if father X, Y uh, works as a substitution here um, in the case that within this ordering, parent is higher up than father. If we don't actually have the symbol parent in our initial signature of uh, symbols, then uh, we can use an arbitrary additional symbol that we have in our symbol set, maybe P1 or something, uh, and add that in as long as P1 is higher up in the ordering than father. Okay, so that constraint requires that we descend through the set of symbols as we use base. And it's that property that leads to guarantee termination of the, of the whole learning process, the descent process. The chain rule here, um, uh, this is a bit like, <coughs> um, for instance, uh, the rule you might learn for, say, uh, uncle. So an uncle would be somebody who's uh, the uh, brother of a parent or something like that. Um, we can use 
this rule in order to learn something of that kind. And again, the orderings require the p must be higher than both q and r. So if we're adding in new predicates, they must uh, descend in some fashion. In the last case, we're explicitly allowing for the possibility of recursion. This is similar to the ancestor rule, if you remember. Ancestor xy of parent uh, qz and ancestor zy. Um, in this case, we're, uh, in order to make the recursion work, in fact, the constraint here is that uh, xy must contain that interval, xy must contain z. So that's called an interval constraint. And again, that uh, uh, pr produces an ordering over the Herbrand base, which ensures that all proofs terminate. Um, and that's uh, one of the, the, the powerful properties of the, of the ordering that, uh, approach that we use. OK, so I've seen, we've seen what the meta rules look like, but now some things have metalogical form and some things have first order form, and we, we're prob probably more used to the first order form in this example that I showed you, the ancestors and the fathers and so on. So what's, how does the metalogical form of these facts correspond? Well, the ancestors, so ancestor Jake Bob, ancestor Alice Jane, remember these are examples that are going to be used to learn from. This is like the observation stream. Those examples are given to the prover as a list. So this says prove ancestor Jake Bob, ancestor Alice Jane, and so on, right? So they're given as arguments to, if you like, a first order uh, uh, program proof. And so these are uh, themselves um, uh, a kind of higher order substitution that's been given to that argument. The background knowledge, things like Father Jake Alice and Mother Alice Ted, um, appear, if they've been learned already, as background knowledge, as substitutions for the meta rules. Remember one of the meta rules was called instance, well, we can write down these substitutions actually in a first order form. We can say instance is true of Father Jake John, where those are substitutions for the three, Jake and John, are the substitutions for P, X, and Y, giving you, if you rewrite that into first order form, Father Jake Alice, right? So we can, we can even, we can treat the uh, substitutions as though they were uh, metallurgical facts, um, which means that the learning is always learning over a ground space, okay? so, which makes it a, a more contained space for learning. Um, the instantiated hypotheses, again, we can treat these as, as a bit like those facts there. So here we've got base, the names of the various different uh, meta rules that have been used. So, for instance, uh, this one here, P1XY if mother XY, is the base rule with the substitution P1 mother. Okay, and this one here, ancestor etc., is the tail recursive rule with ancestor P1 and ancestor. So these are the metalogical substitutions that are carried around. So in your um, meta rules for the tail recursion, you yep. insisted that the arguments x, y, z had this ordering. Yes. Um, but there's no that they aren't mentioned in the meta form at all. Those arguments. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm not showing the ordering over the signature with on this slide, uh -huh. but separately from this, uh, that there would be an ordering that was given to. For those, right. uh, for those, okay. yeah. Um, and the existence of such orderings is necessary in the present way that this has been devised, and is also one of the issues that uh, we're still looking at from, you know, in terms of a challenging issue. How do you get those orderings automatically? In fact, uh, with one of those examples that I showed you we got some clue as to how to do that by the, de the dependency learning actually provides you with an idea of how to order the symbols that are being introduced. But that's a, a kind of ongoing issue, how to do that. 
At the moment, they're just given by the user. OK, uh, so um, uh, the logical form of the meta rules I mentioned um, has both existential and universally quantified variables in it. So when I write this down, pxy of qxy, um, either of these, you, ne you need to think actually that these are being written out like this if you wrote it out properly um, in a logical form. So p and q are existentially quantified and x and y are universally quantified. Um, the value of having uh, the uh, existential quantification over the over the the higher order variables is particularly in supporting predicate invention. Um, it turns out that actually you can have these variables in the in in the the arguments. In which case, grounding of those you can think of as object or entity invention. So you can actually potentially introduce objects into the world or entities into the world which were not mentioned in the original problem but which make the description simpler. It's not just relations that we're talking about but also the objects of the world. And in many cases actually that's a very natural thing to do. So for instance uh, if I were trying to plan my way across this room I might plan how to get to the middle of the room first. But there wasn't a description of the middle of the room in the initial description. But I can say, OK, P1 is the, is the middle of the room. That's a particular place. And I can go on from there. So um, we, uh, we consider, uh, in this case, that we've got this limitation of H22, uh, which contains uh, predicates, as I said, with arity at most two, and at most two atoms in the body. And the first time that we were thinking about this, it was just in the context of learning um, uh, uh, family relations. But after do, reading up the literature, we realized that, in fact, uh, this is a, a well-known subset of, of uh, prologue uh, that had been investigated as far back as 1977 by Tarnlund, who had demonstrated that that subset has universal Turing machine expressivity in the case that it's not just limited to data log. We have to have functions of arity uh, at least one in order to be able to do that. And here, this shows you a little universal Turing machine that is written, um, which uses H22. Uh, and it's obviously extremely simple to write a, a kind of general purpose UTM in this way. The S's here you should think of as the tapes to the machine. So uh, this is before and after. So uh, if you get a halt symbol on the tape, then you should just leave the tape as that and you're finished. That's the base case. Okay? Then there's a recursive case. If you get um, a, t a tape S, you give a tape T. If you execute S to give you S1, and then you apply the UTM to S1 to give you T, where execute consists of finding the instruction. This is the first instruction on the tape that needs to be executed. And then applying that instruction F to the tape itself. And this, this actually, you can't get, I've, as far as I can see, you can't get out of the, the necessity for higher order uh, uh, introduction of a variable here, which um, represents the instruction being applied to the tape itself. Um, and it's this, in, a, in essence, that higher order aspect to the, to the uh, description that leads to problems to do with halting, the kind of standard problems uh, involved with universal Turing machines. And also now in this context of learning, uh, Asks, we have to ask then how do we limit H22 to avoid the halting problem? And since it's 11 o'clock now, um, I'll leave you with that thought, and when you come back, <laughs> I'll give you a solution. <laughs> or maybe you can give me a solution. Okay, so we'll restart at half past. Okay, uh, so to uh, recap, uh, we've got up to this point uh, where. 
uh, we can see that even the H22 language is uh, very expressive. Uh, uh, and uh, so there's an issue, how do we deal with this? Well, in a sense, we don't need to worry too much if actually we're dealing only with data log. But many of the problems that are of interest are non-data log here and have real uh, halting issues, therefore. Okay, so, um, so now I'll turn to the way that uh, this and other issues are, are dealt with in the implementation. And there's various different aspects to it. The first of which is a notion which is uh, borrowed essentially from early work by Nuthan Bendix, um, which was on uh, making uh, confluent um, rewrite systems back in the 1970s, so uh, Bendix was an al algebraic, uh, was an algebraist, and uh, he, he uh, linked up with uh, Donald Knuth um, with the issue, how, if I've got a set of rewrite rules, how do I ensure that they can terminate? And uh, Knuth came up with this uh, very beautiful and elegant way of uh, introducing an ordering over the rewrites um, that ensured uh, confluence or termination of those rewrites. Um, the idea is revisited um, in the 90s um, in the context of deductive databases by ya, uh, Yaya and uh, Minka, um, who show that with deductive, data, with deductive database programs, which are basically data log, um, you can guarantee termination again by introducing a lexicographic ordering uh, over uh, over your rules, over the, over the atoms that you have, and uh, this uh, guarantees termination. Within, with the, this is kind of, there's a, there's a whole area that people have looked at this, and we're actually using two of the ordering mechanisms for ordering the Herbrand base. So um, we're using a mixture of lexicographic ordering, um, which works uh, for non-recursive programs, and interval ordering, uh, which uh, is necessitated for recursive programs, a bit like when I showed you Ancestor, it's not simply enough to order the predicate symbols. You actually have to have an ordering over the, um, over the Herb, uh, Herbrand universe, over the domain of discourse. Um, if you've got both of those, then you can apply uh, lexicographic um, a mixture of lexicographic and interval ordering in order to guarantee termination. Right, so, um, so now, now our learner and the programs that it learns are guaranteed to terminate. Um, you might say, well, that's, that's all we need to worry about. But actually, even so, the space of theories that we're building um, grows exponentially in the number of symbols uh, and the number of uh, clauses that we allow. So uh, there's a second idea that's introduced into the implementation, which is that of, of episodes. This comes from the notion of episodic learning, which uh, is a cognitive science idea, um, that when you are learning particular concepts, um, then you can imagine that, uh, you know, as, as instances of these concepts, suppose you're learning about parents and so on, um, every time you get a new fact about parents, it goes into a box about parents, and once that box is full enough, then you try to, you, you say that episode can now be learned, and uh, the, uh, the learning can be carried out with respect to the other episodes which you've got partial definitions. So that's what we're assuming here. We've got um, a sequence of related learned concepts, and each one is associated with an episode. Each predicate has its associated episode. So the advantage of, of episodic learning is that you build one definition on top of another. And uh, what that means is that the, the, the Learning time is additive rather than multiplicative. You don't need to look at the cross product of all of the learn, learned concepts in order to do the learning as long as you order those episodes. Um, the third aspect uh, is uh, uh, introduced, which is, the, 
which is here, is related to exploring within an episode the various different concept classes in order. So you might start off by assuming, well, I don't actually need to add anything. I can explain everything I've got, so I, don't, I need zero new con uh, clauses to be added. Failing that, if there are some facts that can't be explained, let's be conservative and just assume we need one extra clause, and we'll try to learn with that under that uh, constraint. And if that fails, um, then we'll go to two and so on. Now, uh, this is reminiscent uh, of um, uh, uh, search techniques um, in, uh, called uh, iterative deepening, which are known in AI search, the AI search literature, and have been proved to be um, optimal uh, in various different senses with respect to other forms of search, to, to depth first and be uh, beam search. The results from the 1980s showing that. One aspect of it is that you only ever explore the smallest concept space needed, right, in order to terminate. And in fact, the extra effort that you require um, is within a constant amount of having only explored that size concept space. So the K that is needed is the minimal K. And an, an artifact of that is that the theory that you build is the smallest it can be, uh, so you get most compact theories that are constructed. So, um, so we've got a, an approach to learn minimal uh, uh, definitions in close to the minimum amount of time and building one episode on top of another. So the, all of these help with the efficiency. Um, now, uh, in fact, we're still allowing ourselves an arbitrarily large size theory to, to uh, we uh, step up through these spaces. In, uh, in machine learning, um, people tend to have uh, quite strong requirements. And one of these is, was introduced by Leslie Vallant in the 1980s. It's called hack learning where you can guarantee probabilistic learning time um, with respect to the number of examples and, and size of the theory that you build. Um, so uh, so probably, probably approximately correct learning requires that your whole learning process must terminate in polynomial time. And in fact, in the Ichikai paper that we presented this in first, we, we proved a pack result, which is, a, which is kind of the strongest, one of the strongest forms of machine learning result, in a very restricted case. So assume that uh, you uh, assume that you are given n examples, then if you bound this sequence here to be to an N, that is, it's, you're only going to ever consider a very restricted uh, search space, then it turns out that you can explore that in polynomial time. Um, so there will be cases in which uh, you're, uh, you, so if, if, your, if your theory can be expressed, there will be a sufficient such that it can be captured but uh, you'll need a lot of data to do it. So this is like the big data assumption, right? Uh, you want to learn something, you need heaps and heaps of data. So I'm not suggesting this is a good idea because this turns into learning. I'm just saying that, in fact, if you want very strong uh, guarantees of efficiency, uh, it's possible within this, uh, within this setting. So the implementation of the system we've published for, uh, in the Machine Learning Journal paper, I showed you uh, a reference to at the beginning of the talk. You can get that system and code and together with the data sets associated with, that, that we had in that paper. So there's various experiments we showed it. Um, so you can try it out yourself if you want to. Okay, so uh, one of those experiments that I mentioned already was um, uh, robotic strategy learning. And here, last time I showed you this, 
positive examples. In fact, um, the positive examples were something like A and B. First, we tried, we tried providing only positive examples, and we got a very simple um, theory for building a wall. So in this theory that's learned, the dyadic predicates represent action. So the arguments are states of the world, and each action has a, a pre-state and a post-state, uh, we can carry out tests on those using monadics. So here is a post-condition test action. A very simple variant of this where you just learn from positive examples. That's the definition Once you provide the negative examples, it finds it's not sufficient to simply uh, add more and more, fetch and add more and more uh, 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 bricks from the random set of bricks that's been provided, because that would simply provide. Um, instead, to make it stable, you imagine that in, you, in trying these out, certain ones of them fell down and those become negative examples. You need a more complex theory in which we can then guarded uh, action factors and puts on top of, and then there's a test to make sure. Lines of bricks are offset and continuous. So uh, the invented predicates here are both the um, So uh, here's uh, a, an accuracy graph to show how the learning uh, builds up. The predictive accuracy actually, once you're up to um, default accuracy half of them the randomly chosen examples were negative and this is the learning time which is almost linear in line with the uh, with the uh, time uh, result the t time constraint results that we had Okay. Um, so we decided we would look at uh, other uh, problems. Uh, I visited uh, uh, Tom Mitchell's group across in Carnegie Mellon after I saw that uh, Tom and his group were doing some rather interesting uh, and exciting work uh, from my perspective. Um, this is the never-ending language learning project. Uh, so they started this in 2010, um, and uh, this number's probably out of the idea behind it was to, uh, to read web pages, right? To, to extract uh, information from web pages and to express it as triples, where these triples represent um, subject, verb, phrase, object triples. Okay, so uh, this gives you um, an example of a mongo. Here plays baseball. So there are millions of these facts that have been extracted from reading web pages. And uh, of, it was in, of interest to us because uh, these are essentially dyad it's a huge dyadic database so with working by working with Tom we we uh, took some of this data and tried to um, learn uh, to, to learn some things from it okay so we were able to learn uh, some definitions for instance here in uh, home stadium of Z is Y, um, but when so this form of learning had been uh, carried out by William Cohen uh, within uh, the group. When we actually looked in detail at uh, some of these rules, they turned out to be rather weird because although the rule itself appears to be correct, um, it's, uh, it allows you to abduce a bunch of facts. The, all of these facts were not in the Dell database. And only some of them were true. 
Okay, so um, two, four, five, and six uh, earned by looking up web pages. So you could type them in, uh, in using Google and search, and you'd find a web page which told you, for instance, that Lakers, which was not uh, part of the NEL database. But one and three turned out to be false. And the reason that they were false turned out to be quite intriguing because um, the, uh, there were certain assumptions that had been built into the way that the parsing of the sentences had been done, including uh, an assumption that uh, for every uh, stadium, there was exactly one uh, team for which that was the home stadium. And uh, this was not true, for instance, uh, for the stadium that had Los Angeles uh, Lakers. The stadium that, in that case, uh, in Los Angeles, had four different teams in it. So if you made that assumption implicitly, as they did, you ended up with um, uh, even though you could learn this rule from the facts and the, the rule itself was right, the implicit knowledge ended up giving you some, some errors in, in what could be abused. So, uh, so this was of interest and fed back to uh, the group uh, there and uh, I'm not sure if they fixed it but it at least shows you something interesting about the kinds of unusual errors that can be built up by such a system. Um, so, uh, the medical system actually has the capacity not just to learn first order rules. If you look at the way it's defined, you can actually learn higher order rules and you can use them as background knowledge. So, in this case, we put in some higher order information. So, sorry, we learn some higher order information uh, using meta rules of this kind. Uh, P, X, Y, if symmetric P, and P, Y, X. Um, and we were able to use that to learn uh, that certain predicates were symmetric. So, uh, again, this is something which Tom and his group were already doing, but they were doing this by hand. Okay, so they were introducing relations behind the scene um, which would uh, boost the am amount of inference that was possible from the facts that they had. But they didn't have a mechanism to do this, partly because that mechanism would require them to do higher order reasoning. And the, they didn't have the higher order information to do that, and we were able to sh demonstrate that it was possible to do that using Metagol. Okay, so... Um, so Metagol uh, is a system uh, which does predicate invention. Um, if you look at the idea of predicate invention, it goes back quite a way, as I mentioned. In fact, the early days of ILP, uh, there were a number of different people who were working in this area, but all using some, a, a variant of what was called um, inverse resolution. So Ray Buntine and I uh, published on this first in 1988, 89, Ruverol and Puget uh, did something similar. Stahl did a, an overview of the, the area of predicate invention in 1992. And you'll find very little after that before this recent work uh, with meta-interpretive learning. It kind of died out through, uh, through the belief that it, it couldn't really be done very efficiently. Um, abductive predicate invention something which, again, is related to what uh, Metagol does. And uh, it, this was investigated by Katsumi Inoue uh, in Japan in 2010. He and Koichi Furukawa uh, showed that you could do, at least at the propositional level, you could do, meta, uh, you could do predicate invention. And they had a series of papers about that. But it really was limited to the propositional level. All of their examples showed, for instance, that you could introduce new 
propositions uh, that would allow you, for instance, to reason over biochemical chains of, of reactions. That was one of the domains they were looking at. This meta-interpretive learning approach uh, was the first one to contain an explicit meta-interpreter. And it generalizes the inner way approach so that it can actually represent first-order relations. And the first thing that we looked at was learning regular and context-free grammars. Um, and this, uh, this was ex interesting and exciting. First of all, you can't really learn uh, either, e even a regular language, without effectively doing predicate invention and, and recursion. Uh, but re learning regular languages is something that's been done in various different forms in machine learning uh, right back even to the 1950s. There were, uh, Moore had methods of searching through the regular space. Um, Context-free grammars, on the other hand, you find there aren't any general uh, approaches to learning context-free grammars that don't involve at least uh, being given the parse uh, of the sentences involved. So learning these from free text has been a kind of open issue and we had, here we were presenting a general purpose way that used a meta-interpreter that was able to learn context-free grammars quite effectively. We were, in our experiments we were showing we could uh, learn randomly chosen uh, as long as they weren't very um, Higher order logic learning, so learning higher order formulae, or using background knowledge, which is higher order, again, has a long history. Uh, so we were doing this in an ILP context back in the John Lloyd uh, explored this in 2003. Um, but again, it, the, the forms of higher order logic that were being investigated here were really quite uh, expressive. Um, they didn't have any of the restrictions that we And there were difficulties in making this approach efficient. Higher order data log is a very much more restricted uh, subset of higher order logic, and it was it was explored back in 2012 by uh, Nils Pallavi as a student. When we were looking at this, we weren't looking at it in the context of a meta interpreter. In fact, this higher order data log that is one which we're using within the medical setting, uh, but in the context of it of an interpreter. Okay, so um, uh, so going back to the the summary from the previous uh, set, you can now see in more detail um, how hopefully how uh, this is a form of declarative learning. I think I've explained now what H two two is and why it's uh, tractable in this context, uh, partly because of the use of the uh, index uh, ordering mechanism. Um, and uh, we need to, to consider how to we look at the rule about symmetry, for instance, that I showed you. If you try to learn a rule about transitivity in the same form, um, as a kind of general uh, definition that could be filled in for identifying uh, transitive relations. It's most natural to express that using a, a kind of triadic logic. Um, so we need to be, have a better idea of how to do that. Uh, there is no way at the moment that we have of dealing with classification noise, although there are there are proposals as to how to do that within the setting that we're looking at. Probabilistic meta-interpretive learning is something that I'm going to deal with in the next lecture. And I'll show you where we're up to with that. And one of the um, one of the potential advantages of looking at this probabilistically is that we may also, we, it may solve the classification noise problem. It may also give us an idea of how to do active learning. Now, what act, the meaning of active learning so, uh, is in contrast with passive learning. So passive learning involves being given basically a database of facts from which you learn. You learn a model. 
in active learning, you may be given an initial set of, 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 of uh, observations, but you then select uh, questions which are, are useful for dividing the hypothesis space. So you actively ask questions of the world, or in the context of, of, a, of a scientific investigator, uh, you actually go out and devise experiments which you carry out in the world, and the outcome of those is used to revise the theory. So active learning is actually very important and relevant to uh, human learners who treat learning more of a, as a dialogue than they do as simply a passive, receptive task as it is in most, uh, most machine learning. Okay, so uh, so we now finished lecture two. Um, any questions on that? Do you I talk about higher order logic? Uh, in some of the robot examples, we're looking at third order because you're reasoning about a robot that's reasoning over. Um, and uh, I can see that in that context, once you start doing reasoning, for instance, over the belief system, you could go higher than that quite easily. Out to, to, to lectures. Um, no, um, I mean, it's very restricted what we're doing still. Um, but uh, yeah, so given those restrictions, it wasn't. Any other questions? Okay, um, so uh, since you just had a break, I think I can just go on to the next one. Okay, so um, in this third lecture, I'm going to uh, show you uh, how the probabilistic part of this scheme um, works. Uh, now, for, for those of you uh, who are adamantly against the use of probabilities mixed in with, uh, with symbols, it's worth considering the fact that it's almost unavoidable uh, in the context of inductive reasoning, although you don't really need probabilistic reasoning when you're, you're, do, when you're acting deductively. Um, in an inductive setting, there is always some degree of doubt over the generalization that you're being made, unless you're given, provided with complete example sets. So the question is how to do that in a, uh, in, in a, uh, a well-founded way and uh, we're using a Bayesian inference setting uh, in this context. Okay, so the, the paper uh, for this lecture um, is uh, this one, which is a, a conference proceedings paper, and is as yet the only paper in, on this, uh, on this uh, topic. So, and again, that, that's available from my publication page. Okay, so um, uh, if you think about uh, the, what's happening with a meta interpreter. So you've got a set of facts that are being provided, and um, essentially you have a deductive uh, space of, of, of inferences that can be carried out. You can look at a resolution tree where um, the aim is to use uh, a uh, goal. Um, goal in this case happens a set of examples, um, but the refutations can follow different lines. Okay, so as we go down these lines, various different abductive assumptions. These are the substitutions, the meta-substitutions that are made. 
as the matter interpreter goes through the various possibilities. The case that we're learning, for instance, with building a finite state, is would into a network that's being built. Once you have a complete derivation, which is basically leaf, that leaf will contain the set of assumptions that are made to complete the methodological assumptions that are made in order to proof, which can be interpreted for it in this case. Okay, so um, we we can think of that. So what's happening with the, uh, if, if we view that in a, in, in a way in terms of program refinement? Uh, each one of these paths down to a leaf from the from the root of that tree is a series of refinements, or what Shapiro called refinements of the program, where we're adding in a single clause into that program at each time. The refinement tree that Shapiro talks about is actually the resolution tree of this uh, meta interpreter in this case. These things are not distinct in the case of meta And that's part of what makes it interesting, that the, a purely deductive scheme can be treated as providing a set of possible solutions. Right. Now, the set of solutions are the set of consistent hypotheses, right? Uh, if we assume that those consistent randomly, the probability of we would have a way of sampling consistent hypotheses, right? So we don't, in developing our sample, we don't look through all of the solutions look at one of the solutions randomly. Clearly this sampling mechanism should be more efficient and uh, this approach uh, in other parts of the literature is called stochastic refinement. That is selecting a theory, a consistent theory stochastically or randomly uh, through selection. Okay? So by modifying the meta interpreter so that it makes its selections not by um, linear resolution uh, or SLV, uh, select left linear resolution, but by random choice or by what's called a, a stochastic logic program approach. If we may turn the interpreter into a stochastic logic program, then we get the effect of randomly choosing hypotheses. Okay, so um, there's a little framework, uh, maybe a bit detailed here, but um, which shows that this refinement framework we can, we, can, we can put in formal terms. So the setting is that we're explaining a set of examples to, uh, to entail uh, the hypothesis. Okay, so if, we need, if B and H entail E, then B and not E entail not H. This is called the inverse. The meta rules um, are of the form that we've already seen. So we have various different meta rules that are being executed in order to generate these hypotheses. This is being done stochastically, labeling with probabilities various different theories that are generated in this way. And in Bayesian terms, we can see these theories as having a prior. The prior is a, is a exponential descent prior where the deeper the theory is in the tree um, uh, that can be derived, the lower its probability is, and that probability decreases exponentially with the depth. Um, in order to make this a Bayesian inference problem, we also need to define the likelihood. And the likelihood is simply a zero one function depending on consistency, uh, which will 
uh, when multiplied by the prior, gives you the overall Bayesian function. So the posterior is a normalized version of the This is enough to give you a Bayesian setting um, for, uh, for inference over uh, randomly chosen uh, consistent hypotheses. Okay, so we have the same generalized meta-interpreter uh, as, uh, as before. I'm highlighting here um, the rule name uh, form I had it in the previous one. And just remembering those colors, uh, you can see that, for instance, for building a finite state acceptor, uh, here are the various different meta rules that we states, delta states, here, logic with fathers and mothers and so on. Um, we can write out the instance base and tail rec and, and chain rules. So, Simply by adding appropriate meta rules, we could either build finite state acceptors or uh, dyadic um, theories. So the form of these meta rules doesn't change. The fact that we're doing probabilistic inference, we're still going to be using meta rules in order to formulate the hypotheses. It's just that the selection of those hypotheses we're thinking of as being random. OK, so what does that give us? Um, it actually uh, can be used in a variety of ways. So, so uh, in, the, in the setting of Bayesian inference, in fact, there are two uh, standard types of uh, predictive algorithms that can be built, one of which um, uh, simply produces uh, the, the uh, predi predictions from the hypothesis which has maximum a posterior probability. This is called the MAP algorithm to, to Bayesians. And we can generate MAP solutions by finding the, the solution in the space which is uh, highest up in the derivation space. And in fact, the algorithm that I've shown, been telling you about, Metagol, can be viewed as a MAP predictor because it chooses the smallest number of clauses, which then have the highest probability. But map solutions, although they're known to have reasonably high accuracy, uh, are usually contrasted against Bayes predictors. Now, a Bayes predictor has the highest predictive accuracy that any uh, such predictor could have. So it has it's the, it's the most accurate uh, learner that is possible. If you use it in the context of learning, if you're able to do uh, Bayes prediction, you necessarily beat every machine learning algorithm that's out there. So it's taken as a kind of um, theoretical uh, base for comparison. So there's a, it, 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 it models ideal learning and in general has been taken to be uh, something which is really only of theoretical uh, interest. What's interesting in this context, though, is the requirements of a Bayes predictor are that you are capable of sampling consistent hypotheses. Okay? If you can do that, then you can arbitrarily well approximate a Bayes predictor by, doing, by sampling and then averaging the predictions of the results uh, produced by those consistent that's exactly what this setting that I've been describing gives us. It gives us the ability to approximate ideal uh, machine learning by doing model averaging. Turns out there's more than one way to do uh, model averaging, one of which uh, is based on uh, doing sampling with replacement, which is the more standard way of doing sampling for statisticians. Uh, and the other is sampling without replacement. So, if you just to give you an idea of what this means, so um, suppose that 
I'm sampling uh, with replacement. If I had a bag of beans and I take a sample out, uh, every time that I take out a red bean, I have to put it back in again before I take the next sample out, right? So the bag of beans acts like as though it's infinite because I'm never going to exhaust it because I'm ever, only ever taking one out, uh, counting it, and then putting it back in again. Sampling without replacement is the process by which you take the beans out successively and you don't put them back in. So you can only take a finite size sample if you're sampling without replacement. And the statistics of these two are quite different. Standard uh, statistics generally use sampling with replacement rather than without replacement. Okay, when implementing this system, it turns out that if you do sampling with replacement, which is the simple thing to do, you will end up um, only sampling very simple theories. You end up uh, using the information that you have from the, from the posterior, uh, the, the derivation space, very inefficiently. And we realized this uh, within days of implementing it, that we're not going to get good estimates for our Bayes predictor by doing this. So, in fact, so instead, we turned to try to figure out an efficient way to do sampling without replacement from the hypothesis space. And this turned out to have um, an interesting solution to doing so, which, uh, as far as we know, d doesn't appear elsewhere in the literature. Now, you remember the stochastic refinement tree weights. So imagine that we're considering that tree. At the base of that tree is all the consistent hypotheses. And uh, now consider that uh, you took the hypothesis space, that you took the interval space, you divided it uh, goes from zero to one. Um, each one of the derivations, as they come down, this part here, ends up, because this, this part represents one third of the probability volume, ends up summing to one third. The ones that come from the middle one end up summing to two thirds of the So to one third again. Uh, now imagine that all of the hypotheses, the consistent hypotheses, are added up so that their cumulative probability marks off a subset. Now I want you to consider, um, if I wanted to find the hypothesis that's associated with the middle of the space, i.e. cumulative probability 0.5, under which one of these? I'll ask you again, if you if you want, or I'll restate the facts again. This adds up uh, all of these theories out. I went all the way up to here, adds up to two thirds, and way up to there. So, is it going to be in this one here? I know what the cumulative frequency of the theory that I'm looking for is, I know which branch it is in. And when I go into that branch, I will know once more, because by renormalizing that number, there are two or three there, I'll figure out which one of those it is. So the process of identifying where, where hypotheses are with a particular cumulative frequency can be done very efficiently. So now, consider that I, I look, first of all, for the one which is closest to point 0.1, has given me the frequency of point 0.1, and then I have to come down here and I go straight to point 0.2, I go straight to I'm not going to get any repeats. Okay? I'm going to go just to those points where I know I'm looking for something. I'll also find that they are very spread out, so that they spread evenly 
over the entire hypothesis space. And I can do this sampling by um, a divide and conquer where I, I find each one of them very efficiently. So this uh, is the approach that is represented for uh, metabase RS without replacement. I sample a certain number of hypotheses which are equally uh, spaced out and I use those in order to do the prediction. Um, so uh, now let's see what happens. Which of these does best? In terms of con convergence, Um, typically does best. Okay, in this in this first case with regular grammars, in the second case where we don't have. But more importantly than that, in some ways, is that if we look at the map learner, which is the green learner, the green learner never actually does as well as the blue one, but it doesn't. still not converging as fast. Well, we expect that. We've built something that approximates ideal machine learning, which is the, uh, the map, the, uh, the base predictor. But even if we just choose the simplest theory, um, we're not going to uh, do much worse uh, than, than ideal. The difference actually converges uh, and it's almost wiped out when we have a large number of examples. Our th simplest theory turns out to be pretty much the best theory as soon as we have enough data. The difference occurs really in this very early stage when we've only got very few examples. In that stage, then doing Bayesian reasoning, which is 10 or 20 times more uh, time consuming in, in computational terms, is worth it. If you don't have that small data set, it's not worth it because you've got so much data, it doesn't matter practically what machine learning mechanism you use. You converge to the ideal solution if you've got enough data. And to me, this is a very interesting statement about machine learning and also about big data. In, if you've got big data, don't care very much about the way that you do your machine learning. You don't need to use a lot of computation time. If you've got small data, then carefully reasoning through and averaging over the results is worth it. Only in that case is it really worth it. And even then, very simple theories will actually converge pretty fast anyway. OK, so, um, so this is the related work. So. Uh, if you look at Bayes' prediction, um, uh, very early on in, 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 in you know, it's back in the 90s that people were showing at a theoretical level that Bayes' prediction is optimal. Right? It's always been known that there's this kind of, uh, this uh, figment at the back of machine learning that could beat everything if, if anybody was able to do it. Bernardo and Smith showed that in 94. Ray Buntine used uh, similar assumptions in his thesis in 1990. Um, theoretical bounds for the difference between Bayes' prediction and map prediction are published in the PAC model by Kassler, Kearns, and Shapiri in 1994. They show that actually uh, there's no more than a two times difference, uh, two, yeah, two times difference in the error uh, for these two. Um, and uh, but they, they don't suggest any particular way of trying to implement uh, Bayes' prediction, even, you know, even as an approximation. However, uh, in the 90s, people start looking at an ensemble methods within uh, machine learning, particularly early people, Fro Freund and Shapiri and Zhu and Zhu, and they show that actually you can boost predictive accuracy of simple learners by, you, by doing ensembles which average over the hypothesis. So you can, you can do this if you say generate consistent decision trees and uh, average over their predictions. You can get slightly higher accuracies. These are not massive any time that they're published. Um, and uh, in recent years, 
relational learning and probabilistic adaptive logic programming, um, I, it's been shown that by using probabilistic representation, you do slightly better than non-probabilistic uh, representations. And one way to, uh, to understand this, uh, this, this last result, i.e. the probabilities being incorporated into the representation itself, is that what you're representing is a form of model averaging um, that can be learned as a single consistent probabilistic hypothesis. Okay, so um, to, to summarize all of this, um, uh, the, uh, what, what we managed to show is that you can implement a prior uh, over a hypothesis space, which is what you, what's required for Bayesian inference, uh, as a, uh, a, a stochastic logic program version of a higher order uh, meta interpreter. Um, by sampling over that, that will allow you to, uh, and, and averaging those uh, samples, it allows you to approximate um, an ideal uh, learner, a Bayes predictor. Um, and in practice, uh, such a, 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 a predictor is implemented up to uh, quite a high accuracy, which beats standard uh, learning mechanisms. So it outperforms MAP, which is used, which is the basis essentially of many machine learning algorithms. The cost of doing that, though, is high. Um, the speeds, as I said, for the, even for these trials, was about 10, uh, 10 to 30 times slower than simply finding the simplest theory. Um, so you get small performance increases, but you get high costs in doing so. Um, and we're, we're looking at the moment in, at uh, trying to uh, use this kind of approach in order to support noise tolerance uh, for map learning. Uh, by uh, sampling small subsets of the examples, and building a consistent theory for those small subsets, and then testing it on the larger data set. Similarly, for active learning, unlabeled data sets, and looking at ways of calculate, of using the probabilities from uh, the, the Bayes model in order to compute entropy values for the individual unlabeled examples. Select those examples which have maximum, maximal en entropy, i.e. they will actually provide the most information if you knew their true label. Okay, so, uh, so that's, that's the end of the talk and that's where we're up to with this general form of matter interpreter. Further questions? So, what Bayesian approach helps you with when you don't have complete information? Actually, like that? No, no, it's more than that because, yeah, I mean, so in a sense, machine learning is only interest of interest when you don't have all of the data. Uh, but uh, the the Bayesian approach allows you to entertain possible worlds, okay? In this case, the possible worlds are different consistent theories. The only uh, world descriptions that are, could be entertained are those that are consistent with the information that you've got, assuming that that information is correct. That's why you can't deal with noise. False. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so, uh, so we're, uh, that's the limitation of what we're doing at the moment. And what I was saying is that we can soften that by taking subsamples of the data as, and assuming that they're correct. If the noise levels are low, then some of those subsamples will actually all be consistent. And you can actually, if you knew the noise level, you can calculate exactly what the probability of choosing a consistent set is. Um, uh, so uh, the bait. So without the bays, Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't. Ra the, 
the base gives you a natural way of ranking them, and it gives you, uh, so the ranking is consistent with a particular assignment of probability. Prior assignment. Basically, um, Markovian, treating the derivations as Markov chains. Any more questions? We're all very tired by this time. It's not only the end of this talk, it's the end of the week. So. <laughs> Thank you very much.